operations. We started out nine years ago in 2012, end of 2012, um, as a transfer station advisory committee. And that was basically to help residents um, transition to single stream recycling. Um, but as we got that under control, we started taking on more tasks that we added energy to our charge. And then a few years ago, um, when we became, um, there was a program called Sustainable CT in Connecticut and Darian joined that. Um, so we then became the Sustainability Committee. So this, so we, in 2019, we um, applied for and were awarded bronze certification from Sustainable CT. And I know you want me to talk about the food scrap program in particular, but I'll just mention, you had also said ways that you can help yes, us. Yeah. So we are in the process of um, applying for recertification from Sustainable CT. And this is just a voluntary program um, that um, recognizes thriving and resilient Connecticut municipalities. And you're and saying that's a re we have to recertify. Yes. Bonds. So we were um, awarded certification yeah. in the end of 2019, and it's for a three-year period. Oh, okay. But you have to yeah. you have to reapply in your last year. Mm -hmm. So 2022 mm -hmm. is our last year. So we are in the process of um, uh, completing this rather cumbersome application yes. process. And in doing so, it's, it's actually a really good exercise because it helps to recognize a lot of things that the town is doing that, like every, you know, it's like this hand doesn't always know what that hand's doing. And I don't necessarily mean the, the town, town hall, but I'm talking about various organizations yes. uh, throughout town that the town might have some affiliation with. Um, so this, this application process sort of gives us the opportunity to... Um, to recognize all the wonderful things that are being done that sort of meet the criteria of making Darien a welcoming and um, thriving community. And it's not just natural resources that we recognize the things for, though that would be the mm -hmm. area that you would be most interested in, but it's also like vibrant cultural ecosystems, renewable and efficient energy infrastructure, um, strategic materials management and thriving local communities. Those are all things that contribute to making um, like a, a, a thriving community. So, but that is an area perhaps. Uh, I know we we sort of focused on the food scrap recycling as much as anything. I really hope to be able to have our commissioners uh, un understand that program in particular, so that they can go out be ambassadors for that uh, as much as anything and. Um, in their absence, you know, I'll urge them to look at this recording and or listen to the recording. But it seems to me that perhaps there's uh, it, ways in which the Beautification Commission can be uh, helpful in the certification program too, in the Sustainable CT certification program with the work that we're doing around. Definitely, around yeah. yes, yes. The um, the pollinator gardens that yes. have been installed. I mean, those I I can send you PDFs of specific parts of the application yes. where that will come into play, but we will actually earn points on our application for the work that you've been doing. Yes, and I think that would, um, the work that we've done would have been after the original bronze application that you made. Yes. So that this would be additional. Yes. Because I think that I talked to you or somebody in connection with the pollinator pathway, but the Beautification Commission's own work I think has Come yes, our look back night. period for the um, purposes of um, this application, it goes back to um, January of 2019. Oh yes, yeah. so we're definitely after that. Yeah. So that's good. I think we can be very young. Um, yeah, no, and I'm really excited about that because those are some areas where we didn't necessarily, we, we got points for pollinator pathway yes. on the last application, mm -hmm. but we didn't, um, we didn't get we we will be able to get points for the work that you've done in front of town yes. hall and at um, Tilly Pond and some of the other places that you've mentioned. Burn, maybe. Yeah. Yes, so we yes. we just need to catalog all of right. those areas and you know pictures yeah, and then can I can pop those that. into the application. Yeah. Excellent. So thank you so much. So so that's exactly the whole point of this is yeah. working with boards and commissions and not for profits yeah. in town that can like the land trust for example yeah. where we can um, sort of catalog in a systematic way all the things the wonderful things that are happening in town so um, the food scrap program um, 
So Darien um, started its food scrap program in 2018, October. And I have a little PowerPoint presentation. Do you want me to like turn my computer around and um, sure. I can sort of show that? Um, it kind of gives a little history of it. I think that would be great. Uh, I know it's not going to help the people who are on No, and I, I'm remote. really unable. This, this is so different to Zoom that I can't even find a share your screen. Or <laughs> so I can, when I, I get home, it. I can send this to you yes. via um, Dropbox, like mm -hmm. you suggested, and then you can share it with your membership. Yes, that'll be great. So, um, so yeah, so our um, food scrap recycling program um, started in October of 2018. Now I'm doing this upside down, so I can't figure <laughs> out <laughs> figure out how to do. to move? Would... Oh, um, yeah, maybe if we just switch places that way. Or I, how about if I like go up here like this? Does that does that help? Can you see Sue? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is our food scrap recycling program. And keep it away from the light. Okay. The window. That's it. That's is that good? It. Okay. Yeah. So this is just a little overview of like, you know, in the scheme yeah. of things, like why is a program like this important? So um, in Connecticut, we produce more than 2.3 million tons of waste every year. Here. Let's do that. There. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Well, I'm sorry. It's hot there. And so one of the reasons that like a food scrap recycling program is really important in terms of waste management is because it's such a large percentage of the waste stream. Um, by EPA estimates, and these are very conservative, it's about 22% of all household waste. So if you can kind of divert food from going into the waste stream, you're automatically you know, reducing a ton of, of um, solid waste. In Connecticut, so just to, because a lot of people don't really even think about like where their garbage goes after it leaves their house, but in Connecticut, for the last couple of decades, our garbage has all, has all been um, combusted at uh, a, what they call waste to energy plants. And the reason they call them waste to energy plants is because the heat from combustion is used to make steam that turns turbines and they generate electricity from it. So it's though a fairly inefficient way of making electricity, there is some, that's why they call it a waste to energy. Is that what they do in Bridgeport? Yes. Okay. So this is actually a picture of that okay. particular facility. It's the Wheelabrator Bridgeport mm -hmm. plant. And so we have currently five of those um, combustion plants in the state of Connecticut that incinerate our trash. But the second largest one, which is um, in Hartford, is going offline um, in July of this year. So they, that particular plant services more than 50 towns, and it's just, it's reached its, the end of its useful life. And a decision was made by the state a couple of years ago not to rebuild it because there's a $300 million price tag, two or $300 million, at that point it's, it's so high, but it's not going to be rebuilt. So the towns that are being serviced by this particular um, waste to energy plant are now trucking their MSW out of state, so it's going. Which is a really <coughs> short-term solution, and as I understand it, and maybe this is wrong, but those facilities are not clean facilities. As I understand it, they produce a lot of toxic uh, fumes. There are emissions. I mean, they. We actually toured the Wheelabrator plant a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. um, 2018, I think, um, and they, you know, they have all kinds of like what they call scrubbers that. Um, take some of the particulates and some of the chemicals out of the emissions that are coming yeah. out. But yeah, I mean, there's still, you know, <clears throat> there's still a lot of stuff that yeah, comes out of the I mean, the reason that stacks. I've done at least shows that they can only operate certain hours because they have to limit the amount of pollution that they're putting out. And so they, they can't be constantly operating because of the pollution. Right. This, so, this is the one in Bridgeport? Or this is the yes. one in Bridgeport. Yeah. You see it from 95. That, that's yeah. still going. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, my, my recollection from our tour there was that they operate throughout the night, that they do operate pretty much 24 now, maybe there are periods where they shut down, but they have trucks coming in yeah, all, at all hours of the day. Yeah, maybe it's just you know part of it operating, but are there plans to sort of 
update it, update the ones that are existing? I, that I don't know because, uh, I mean, that's one of the, right now we're sort of, I mean, it's not me saying this, the Commissioner of Energy and Environmental Protection has said that the state of Connecticut is in a waste crisis. We, we, we cannot handle our, the amount yeah. of waste that we have right now, so that's why there are a lot of, there's a lot of initiative to try to encourage municipalities to reduce the waste, either through you know, programs like this, you know, food scrappers, although our program didn't start out that way, no, I mean, no, but it, but it it's fits in with that mission. Yeah. I'm wondering, so, just as you're speaking, and I know this will take all day if I keep doing this, but one, as you're speaking, I'm having one thought that the town has adopted this, um, is it Think Smart? Um, yes. All about cyclists and, and, and cars, and it seems to be a very effective way to get messages across to, to people, and if we with you or whoever um, agrees that this is a good idea, if we could create something that is an educational piece around the need to reduce our waste. I mean, there are obviously the bigger uh, initiatives that have to take place, like r resolving how our waste gets disposed of. But if we have less in the first place, because our residents are taught not to pick up a produce bag every time they go to the right, store or, or right. not to or, or to try not to buy things that are wrapped in plastic. All of those those ideas combined with a food scrap program could help reduce our contribution to this problem. Definitely. Definitely and, and yeah, no, and that's like all part of like our sustainable C T application yeah. too is trying to educate residents yeah. on how to reduce waste. It's not just because, you know, there's like, you know, some people think, oh, I can just recycle it. I can just, well, you know, there are a lot of things that can't be recycled. Yes. People put them in recycling, but they can't be recycled. And that's, that's its own whole issue. And we try to work very hard to educate residents on, you know, like, if, if you have any question in your mind whether something should go in the recycling bin, it probably shouldn't. It's probably better not to do that. But we also try to approach it from a different way where, you know, like, to, when you purchase things, like try to purchase things that aren't going to have waste that you have to get rid of in the first place. And it's the same thing with the food scrap program. It's like, I've had a lot of people, to, the, the reason this whole program started was my own personal experience with finding how much, um, how much less I wasted because I was diverting my food from the waste stream. Because I just like was always so much more aware of like what was in my refrigerator, like I wasn't over buying things. And then I was just like, oh, well, I have, you know, I have those scallions in my refrigerator. I need to make something that's going to use those up. So, so that's kind of the idea behind this as well. It's not just a place to feel good about putting your right. food. It, mm -hmm. it, in the end, it helps you not to have as much to waste in the yes. first place. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the whole, you know, like the, the bird's eye view of why we want to do this too. Shouldn't so. we? Work, um, shouldn't we try and educate people in town too to maybe do composting at home? Yes, that's always part of our um, I mean, push. I've, I've always done, had a big compost heap, so um, yes. I don't have never taken um, food scraps to town. You know, to the so town. I personally also um, compost in my backyard, and I have done that for you know almost 20 years. Um, uh, what I use the, the food scrap program for, and this is what I tell other people who compost in their backyard, is it's a nice complement to a backyard composting system because the only things that I put in my backyard composting are fruit and vegetable scraps. I don't put meat or bones or anything you like can't, that. You can't. You can't. Get yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so, um, so we always tell people that there's this program. We always encourage people compost in your backyard. And then for people who don't want to do that and don't want to do the drop-off program, we always advise them that there is a private service that you can hire. It's curbside compost. And they can come in, you know, for a fee, they can come and pick up your food scraps. So there's, there's multiple ways to, um, to do this. Um, but for people who compost in their backyard, I tell them, like, yes, that's, like, that's ultimately that's even better. But this is a nice complement to that program for the things that you need to throw away that don't go in your backyard composter.
So like bones and well, so the town is collecting bones. Oh yes, yes. yes. Well, you'll yes. I'll show you. We'll get to that okay. part. Yeah, no, it's it's um it's all food waste. Well, they're not really collecting them. Yeah, we're we're yeah we're well we I collect mean, I, yeah <laughs> yeah making available place to <laughs> right relinquish because, them. Because the thing is, is to Sue's point, you mm. wouldn't want there are certain things you wouldn't want. They do compost, but you wouldn't want to put them in your backyard because it would attract vermin and so forth. So. Our drop-off program, as we'll see, goes to a commercial composting facility where they're able to handle all food waste. So um, we'll just we'll get to that in just a second. So this is just another quick picture of. Oops. Can I just stop you briefly because we've got Jackie, uh, who is our uh, secretary, is now on line with us, and also Katie. Katie is our newest member of the commission, and Katie, I just spoke about you before you guys join. Uh, so welcome, we're very happy to have you on board. And you may have missed the introduction, but Carolyn Bain is from the Advisory Committee on Sustainability and she is talking to us about the work that that committee is doing. And I, I only just noticed that you guys had joined, so I could bring you up to speed or I really recommend that you watch the beginning of the taping of this, this meeting so um, you can hear that the town is in the process of reapplying for its uh, or recertifying its bronze status uh, with sustainable CT and I think there are ways in which we can um, can certainly help with that so just this this is a really interesting presentation I hope that you'll learn more about Carolyn's work and we can all think maybe at the next meeting about how we can support her and uh, you know whether there are other initiatives that we could uh, we, we could do ourselves so sorry for the interruption <laughs> that's great thank you so this is just another picture of um, this is a picture of a truck coming in to Wheel of Greater Bridgeport, and it's it's the largest of the five waste to energy plants, and they process close to 800,000 tons of solid waste fruit. So there's the truck coming yeah. in, and then you can see in this next picture, like the trash gets picked up by this enormous crane, mm -hmm. um, and I have a video of this, but it wouldn't it wouldn't embed into my PowerPoint. <laughs> Um, and then it's burned, it's incinerated, and I said food scraps not only comprise a large percentage of waste, but because they're wet and heavy, they also reduce the efficiency of the combustion process at these plants. So another reason, not just the fact that they're a lot of the waste, but they, you know, because think about it, like anything that's like wet and heavy doesn't like burn the way like, you know, friable yeah. material does. And a lot so of the stuff that. in underneath that claw, mm -hmm. if, if I had this right, you remember when we toured a uh, um, city carting facility? Yeah. And so you, you think all this stuff has gone there to be recycled and they have a conveyor belt of all the material that's been put in the recycling bin and underneath is a big dumpster. Yeah. And a substantial amount of the things on the conveyor belt are going into the dumpster right. to go to the wheel breaker. Yes. They're not being recycled. Right. So back to Carolyn's yeah. earlier point. Yeah, no, that, that's exactly right. So then the question is, what can help reduce waste? Just, just a question. And I said, simple, divert food from the waste stream. Again, because it's such a large percentage yes. of the waste, over 22%. And then this is just a little um, banner that we have when we sell the kits. Um, dairy and recycles food scraps, and this is, um, so our drop-off program takes food scraps from your kitchen and turns them into nutrient-rich soil that can be used to grow more plants and food. So this is just a photo of some compost that we purchased for a compost give-back program yes. where residents could come and take compost at the at the recycling center, and this was in 2019. But I think that's a great idea because you can really see the end result. Exactly, of the, of it brings it full doing. circle. It's like you yes. know what's going in yeah. the drop-off bins, and then this is what the end result is. Yes. Well, I've had <clears> um, <throat> just rented a house in Vermont for the season, and I had people mandatory the food scrap recycling. In well, Vermont. they have it, but then yeah. I'd have to be, you know, I'd have to have the sticker on my car and everything. So I thought, I know what, I will just store it up over the week and bring it home. <laughs> okay. I. Uh, I could not lift the container. I had so much food from all these people, and I thought, this is so depressing. I thought, okay, I'm very happy that I'm diverting this and bringing it back to Darien and driving it in my car, but it just sh showed that weight from just a yes. few days with yeah. a few people. Mm -hmm. That's what we have to um, divert. It, right. It, it, I, I'm pretty certain that no one in the house normally recycles their food, you know, uh, or 
participates in this kind of system. So that weight that I could barely lift, right. really strong, uh, uh, would normally go into our system. Right. That's terrible. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it's, like I said, that's just one instance. Yeah, it's 22, yeah. Per, you know, it's at yeah. least 22%. Yes. I mean, there are, there are estimates that are higher than that, but that's the EPA's estimate, so mm -hmm. that's what Carol, I can I just, is yeah. there any, because, like, you go to, like, Walmart or Costco or even the grocery store, and things are just packaged with so much extra plastic. And right. Stuff. And I know much of that is because people are stealing things, and so it makes it less likely that people can steal a cassette if mm -hmm. it's wrapped in like this big thing. But that big thing ends up, uh, you know, going in the landfill. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's like kind of um, like getting a little off topic from this, but there is, um, there is interest underway, and, and some states have done this where they, um, they so, so the companies and the producers who make that, like, it's like they make it and then they like never think about it again mm -hmm. because they don't have to deal with it. Right. Ta municipalities, places like the town of Darien, like, we're the ones who have to figure right. out how to get rid of it. Right. So there is, um, there's going to be a bill proposed in the state um, in the state um, legislature in the upcoming session, I believe, that's going to, um, it's, it, I don't know how many different types of packaging it's going to apply to, but it's going to apply to some packaging. Um, and what it does is it makes the producer have a, a vested interest in what happens to it afterwards. So that by virtue of that, they then, like, because they have to have an interest in what happens to the end life of it, they may change the way they package things and the, how they make things to make them either non-existent or more recyclable because mm -hmm. there are a lot of things that can't be recycled. And they'll, of course, pass that cost back on to us as the consumer. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, but it, it's, you know, maybe we will need to share in the cost. Yeah, so yeah. I, I mean, the, this, I mean, I, I don't have my notes about this in front of me right now, but um, this is the way it is all throughout Canada, for example, mm -hmm. and Apparently, it's, I mean, the, the cost is, per item, is, like, de minimis. It's, like, it's, you know, so, I mean, a topic for another day. I mean, that's definitely a problem. You're right. Like, all this stuff that has pa excess packaging that it doesn't necessarily need. So then, um, yes, I mean, we're the best one in the world. You don't want to buy it, but if you need the product, exactly. you have no choice. We're... we're mm -hmm. At their mercy. Right. You need those ink cartridges for your, your computer, yes, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. In blister pack and then yeah, double yeah. sealed. Right, right. Yeah, no, it's crazy. Um, so, Sue, you had mentioned that you didn't know um, what could go in the food scrap program. So, it's Yay, all yeah, food? I'm, I'm just curious about how, the bo how you keep bones, because, you know, typically meat waste gets really smelly. Yeah. Yeah, that's why you wouldn't want to do it in your backyard. Mm -hmm. Although we have a friend who yes. buries it. <laughs> really? Well, in her defense, she boils everything up for her uh, stock. Right. She doesn't. She lets no. So everything is very like no, bleach. I, I yeah. do that with the turd, my turd. Yeah, yes. So do I. Yes. Yeah. And then she, you can. I think it's a bones of that bleach and then she puts them in her vegetable garden yeah buries them deep so the calcium is coming out it for yeah. the vegetables which is fantastic and then she's fenced off the garden right but she is so like an unusual yes. wonderful case like most people would not yeah, accept it's it. a lot of work yeah. so so for the thing for the people who don't want to bleach their bones and <laughs> bury them in their gardens um you can put even if you put your fruit and vegetable in your own backyard composter mm -hmm. which so many people do um, you can still use this program for, you know, things like meat and poultry, fish and shellfish, dairy products, bread and pasta, rice and grains, um, eggshells you would probably put in your composter, um, chips and snacks, nuts and seeds, leftover and spoiled food, um, coffee grounds, tea bags, which you might put in your backyard composter too, cut flowers, and then the program does allow for compost the use of compostable bags. But they have to be the right ones. They have to be what are called BPI certified. And we, um, to make it easy for residents, we, um, we purchase them in bulk and then we sell them for $2 a roll upstairs in the DPW office and to make sure that residents are using the correct bags. So that, that, so that you put the bones in those bags? Yeah. Yeah. So here's a picture. Uh, well, I'm just showing like... Uh, some examples of things, you know, um, you know, pumpkins and 
eggshells and here is like leftovers on a plate, cut flowers. And you can take oil, can't you? you oh yeah, oil. absolutely. And I, I think that's a really good one because you don't want that going down your sink. No, no. And you don't really want that in Yeah, your, that's actually you know, not on our list because we didn't think about it when we started yeah. the program, but so many people have yeah. asked about that. And what I have been told is that um, quote unquote household quantities of cooking oil yes. are, are perfectly normal to right, go in this. And right. so like what I do is like if I have oil from something is like I don't put it all in at the same time just because it like it's very kind of ruins your compostable bag. Yes. Um, but I just like I mix it in a little at a time and it just it just you know dissipates. So so that works really well. So like a jar of drippings. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I you could actually. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Fat, that's, but not that's all at one time. Yeah. I mean you. I mean, if you wanted to like bring your container and like empty it in the drop off, like it, it would get kind of messy. So like, I don't recommend that. Um, but yeah, I would just get rid of it like, you know, a little bit at a time. But like same thing with like bacon fat and everything, like you can just scrape it out. And the other thing that you can put in that isn't on our list is like, cause so many people have said, well, why can't paper towel? If, because, because I tell people you can either use a, a BPI certified compostable bag um, or you can use no bag or you can wrap your scraps in like newspaper or a brown paper bag So they're like, well, why can't I put paper towels in and we didn't include them on the list because at the commercial composting facility They don't want to get a ton of paper mm -hmm. towels just because they don't break You know, they get tend to glom together and they don't break down as well But they also don't want anything that has like cleaning products on it. So I tell people it's okay to put in food soaked um, paper towels if there's not like, you know, a whole roll of them. So so those can go on, but they're not on our approved list just for that re that reason. But you even take newspaper though, even with like the ink, that's okay. Yeah, they recommend black and white. If, you know, don't take a big colorful page out of the paper, but like, yeah, a page of black and white is okay to wrap your scraps in, definitely. And I actually um, use that and um, even like a small piece of corrugated cardboard mm -hmm. to line the bottom of my um, that green bin mm -hmm. because so many people have um, they're like well the bin just gets so yucky and I can't stand it and I'm like well try lining the bottom with a piece of cardboard and then putting your bags in because then when you dump it out it can all go in the the bin the p little piece of co corrugated cardboard is fine um, and, and then your bin doesn't have anything sticking to it. It's maybe will still be a little bit wet, so you'll want to rinse it out, but there's no, there's nothing really sticking to it. So those are like little tricks. So those kinds of compostable materials can go in, um, but just, as I said, not like tons and tons of them because it kind of disrupts the, the process. So this is the, these are the kits that we sell. Um, and you don't have to have a kit to do this. It's just people like them because, you know, you've got the little um, small bin that can go on your kitchen counter or, you know, some people put them in a drawer or under their sink. And then um, that's what the, the compostable bags go in. And then when that fills up, you um, put those in what we call the storage and transport bin, which is this larger six gallon green bin. And it fits perfectly behind like your, your seat when you, um, you know, like when you want to take it to the recycling center, like you just lock the handle and put it behind your driver's seat. It fits very well there. So then you just dump it in when you get to um, the recycling center. I'm losing my place with here. So, oh, so collect. That's so, like so on these the, are for sale up at the public For $25, works. which is basically our cost. We sell, we do not, the town does not make a cent on these. We, we purchase them in quantity and then we sell them at cost to residents. Yeah, and, it, and it's... It's, it's much cheaper to do that than for people to go out and, you know, buy, the, like, these bins here, like, I, I was just looking online recently, they're, like, more than twice what we pay when we buy them in quantity. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so there's that bin, and so you collect it on your kitchen counter or wherever, and then you store it in the green bin, and, like, I keep mine, like, in my garage, but you can keep them, like, on your porch or, you know, a breezeway or whatever. And then, as I said, transport, um, you put it in your car, and you, the next time you go to the recycling center, and then you, here's a picture, um, so you just drop it in and um, in these bins. And there's a big sign there that says food scrap drop-off, so that you know where it's to the right of the transfer station mm -hmm. building, 
and there were bins set up there. And um, then those are, um, oh, and then I just said it's important to minimize contamination. And we've been told by our um, hauler that we don't have a lot of contamination. People, because this is a voluntary program, the people who are doing it like want to do it correctly. So we don't have a lot of contamination, but every so often we do. So you don't want you don't want to put things in there like plastic bags or juice containers or the bags that avocados come in. Like none of those those are not going to break down in a, even in a commercial composting facility, and you wouldn't want them to because they're plastic. And they should get cut up so the birds and stuff don't get yes. caught of them. Yes. So contamination is any material that's not on the accepted list, including plastic bags, twist ties, rubber bands, produce stickers, and food containers. Karen, were you ever successful in getting leaflets put into new uh, residents? Yes. Yes, I did. I, I had postcards made and okay, I gave good. them to Leslie and she put them in the new resident. Oh yeah, but I mean with the Board of Realtors rather than Oh, um, welcome no, on. we haven't done that, but yeah, I should revisit that. Yes, um, the, the, I don't know who's, on the, who's the head of the Board of Realtors now, but uh, Stephanie and Jenna. Even give it to Irene Larissa. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think Debbie Brennan may be our new president. Okay. Irene, though, is there. So I might want to, yeah, get yes. get back to you to get that name. I, I so. think that would be a very, uh, very good thing. So are you saying for people who are, like, looking at homes to buy in Darien? Yeah, well, or? Uh, I, I guess it is a, a welcome pack. When I first came here, I moved like here. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, yeah, so so but we, do, we do have postcards in those. Yeah. yeah. I don't know uh, whether the realtors leave a package of uh, information when they sell a house. That's different than the like welcome wagon yeah. package. Yeah, no, not really. You know, you you do various things. You are verbally mostly. You know, okay. Really pass out, um, but we could. Um, do those could, postcards get? I'm, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Do those postcards get put in like when we get our our renewal? For our dump stickers. Yes, yeah, so, so not the postcard, there, but right? when you get your um, sticker, your new yeah. permit, you get um, a single stream recycling guide, mm -hmm. and on the back of it is like everything that you can recycle in Darien. And then in addition to that, there's a trifold in there, and it has okay. all the things in there. So the food scrap program is definitely mentioned in mm -hmm. all of those materials. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry, so I didn't need to we just, yeah. just personally, um, does that, if you're having bones in that, storage container. I mean, I don't collect, you know, I don't use, get that many bones, mm -hmm. but I'm thinking, isn't it just going to be um, terribly odious, you know, the oh, <laughs> Um, Yeah, I mean, so... It's a little bit in the same. Yeah, I mean, it depends. So, like, in the hot so weather... If you wrap it in newspaper, you're going to be yeah. a little better off. Those, those um, compostable bags really help a lot to contain the odor, I find, personally. Um, Put some trash parsley on them. Yeah. But so, the thing you can do is uh, just keep them in your fridge. I, I, or your, or I your think freezer. Freezer. Yeah, Sue, so there are other little, little parsley. There are other like little tricks yeah. for things. So like um, Juliet just said, like some of the things that you think are going to be really smelly, like you can just kind of keep them in the back of your refrigerator until yeah. you're ready to go so to the recycling smell. center and yeah. then put them in your bin then. In the winter, it's not. In the winter, it's it's, it's really cold. only yeah, yeah. the the stuff really only smells a little, you know, like during the hot weather months. Well, so I, June, July, August, maybe parts, you know, September. Yeah, because of the vegetables and fruit and vegetable scraps, you know, I, you hardly have any issue. I just right. usually put the bones in a plastic bag and put them go, mm. you know, with the garbage. Yeah. yeah. Well, now you can put your bones in your yeah. bag and yeah. then empty them into the, the drop-off. Okay. You can bring them to me if you yeah. want. Yeah. I mean, I find <laughs> in, the, in the warmer weather months, um, because, you know, the, the, the thing is, is like, we're really lucky in Darien that like our recycling center is in like, well, for me, it's in a very convenient location, um, you know, because it's like right kind of in the mm. middle of town and it's like right next to Whole Foods, which, you know, I... I shop at quite frequently. So, or like if you're on your way to the library or your way to town hall, you kind of drive in that direction. So, 
in some of the other communities, like in Greenwich, for example, they started a program based on our, you know, they modeled it on ours too. And um, their recycling center is way on the extreme west part of town. Um, and Greenwich is much bigger than Darien. Mm. So their program really didn't take off until they set up a satellite location at the farmer's market a couple uh, hours a week because yeah. people just weren't willing to travel yeah. all that distance. But in Darien, our town is geographically fairly small and it's in a convenient location so like in the hot weather months I just tend to drop my food scraps off um, more frequently than I do when it's cold and when it's cold I, I go once a week and the warmer weather months I go tw twice you know or if I happen to just be yeah. driving by there I'll go more often but that's that, that's how you address the the odor issue so, but when people. your bin is closed, it, you're not really smelling anything. Mm -hmm. It's only when you like open it to empty it. So, so there's that. And then um, this is the guy who comes to pick up our food scraps. He, it's our, um, this process is subcontracted out to curbside compost, and he is the one who also, if you want them to come to your house, you know, if you want to pay them to come to your house, they will do that. Um, it's a private service, but you know, it, it's not that expensive. It's like thirty-two dollars a month. Yeah, it was anyway. Yeah, it's. It, I think it's about thirty, thirty-two dollars yeah. a month. Yeah, I used them for a while until the I town did. one. Yeah, got same up with me. Two yeah. years. So, um, and then this is Sue. You had asked about like how does the food scraps break down? This is a photo of New Milford Farms in New Milford, Connecticut, and um, this is where they're composted. And there's different ways to compost food. So this is done in windrows. And so basically what they do is the trucks come in with the food scraps and they dump it in a big pile. And then they have this machine like, um, that just like keeps pushing it down. And then they mix it with things like sawdust and leaves and wood chips and things like that. And then they just keep pushing it down and pushing it down. And then it just, you can see like steam coming off it. Like it gets really hot. And this was a really cold day. Um, so it's literally like the size of a football field and they just keep, you know, pushing this material down, mixing it with stuff and, and after, I think I said six, so it takes about six months for the food to break down into compost and, and then they kind of strain it and whatever isn't broken down, they just kind of bring back and it goes through the process again. So it's just kind of like a sifting process mm -hmm. almost. So here is, um, a Raphael from... Um, New Milford Farms and he's just like showing us like a handle. This is what all of that food waste turns into when they mix it with the leaves and you know like I said some it's wood chips and things. Really it is. It's very moist and um, and dark and rich and it's like really really good for your plantings yeah, and I, your vegetables and everything. I've gotten a, a batch from a, a big barrel that we've had and um, the worms in there are unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, and the, yeah, and that's also like, um, <clears throat> in addition to um, the 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 pushing and mixing with other materials, it's the worms and the bacteria and all of that that helps break all the food scrap down. And I should have also mentioned there's different ways to to compost. Um, so there's also a facility in Southington, Connecticut, which is an anaerobic digester, and we, uh, Julia, oh, yes. we visited that. That's the most smelly um, one. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's another way for food scraps mm -hmm. to be um, composted, and um, there's what they call in vessel, and then Stanford has the town, um, city of Stanford has this machine where uh, it's a machine where the food scraps are fed into it and they, it breaks them down, but then they have to take them out, and they have to like cure it, they have to mix it with it. It's like a whole process. They do that in Stanford? They do, oh, that's they fantastic. do. They have, they have two machines now, and oh. um, I forget the exact amount of waste that it can handle, but, um, but then they, have, they get to keep all the, the compost. Could we do something like that in Darien? Well, they had a huge grant from the EPA to purchase oh. the machine. The machine was about $50,000, um, the one that they're using at McGee, uh, the McGee Center now. Mm -hmm. um, the smaller one that they originally purchased, I think, is up at the Nature Center because North Stanford, you know, yeah. they weren't, it was yeah. just too far for a lot of people yeah. to come down. Um, so their, what their goal is, is to have those machines at various places throughout the city. So right. that food right. scraps can. So there's I, my point was just that there's like different ways that this can be oh, done. No, no, it just got me thinking because it seems it may be a large initial outlay, but if it's going to save the cost of 
you know, us shipping. But then there's the labor food. involved yeah. in because people yeah. have to um, manually feed yeah. the machine. Yeah. They have to take it out. They right. have to put it in barrels, and mm -hmm. you know. So I mean, it's definitely. I mean, I they just started doing this. Um, I think in May or June of this year, the last year. Mm -hmm. um, so it's going to be interesting to see how it works. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we're like definitely like looking mm -hmm. at like what everybody's doing. Yeah. Like I, yeah. you know, there there are also like. Um, a couple communities that are um, experimenting with bringing food scraps into their existing leaf composting. Mm. So um, I think um, Mansfield <laughs> does that. So That's interesting. And we do compost leaves at yeah. our facility. We compost about fifty percent of the yeah. leaves that come in. So. Um, you know, that's, but again, that's um, a labor yes. issue too. And so. also an issue to have to keep the animals out. Right. Yeah. Right. Yes, yes, because you will have all that food in there. So then just my summary is just that um, food is... I just is, got a quick question. Oh, sure. I don't know if you guys can see me, uh, but I was wondering if we've ever done a straw poll of the amount of town residents that utilize the recycling center specifically for food waste and compost. So the only metrics that we really have on the program, because we, so I'm glad that you asked this question because we didn't want to have any barriers to people participating in the program. So residents are, and, and, and I don't just say that like flipply, but because in other communities, um, people have had to um, sign up to do the program. And I, we just felt, as a committee, we just felt that we wanted to minimize the barriers to participation. So we did not require residents to sign up for the program. So. Residents don't have to purchase one of these kits and they don't have to sign up. So the only metrics that we have are the number of kits that we've sold and we know that there are a lot of residents who, who use the program who didn't purchase a kit because number one, like I see them with my own eyes doing it. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I, you know, reports from people because a lot of people are just like, well, I live by myself and like I don't really need such a big thing and I, I I'm retired and I go to the recycling center three times a week and so I don't need that. So we just tell them, you know, just use like a piece of Tupperware or, you know, something that works for you. You don't have to have this kit. It's just that if you're starting out and you have a family or more than two people, you know, or more than one person, because um, we're two people and we fill ours up, um, you know, it's nice to have. So we have that metric. We also know the tonnage. We know how many foods, how many tons of food scraps we're collecting a week, mm -hmm. and it's it's it varies. It's it's usually between um, right now and even for the last couple of years, it's really been kind of between three quarters of a ton and a ton a week. Wow. And the um, what's the other That's metric we have? Um, there's something else, and I'm forgetting what it is. Um, so so those are like our two metrics, but. We, and this is one thing that I actually kind of regret. Like, I wish that we had, like, an email list mm -hmm. of people who are participating in the program because um, for what I was saying earlier, like, a lot of people, we've had, you know, there have been some, there's been some attrition. You know, some people have started the program yes. and they're just like, oh, this isn't for me. It's too smelly. I don't like putting it in my car, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But as I said, there are, like, so many little tricks to make it more palatable and I wish that like I had an email list of people that, that I could send like an e-newsletter out to with this kind of information. Maybe you could so. get them to sign up at the dump, you know, have a, you know, a board uh, sign up. Um. Yeah, yeah, I mean, or, you know, just, um, you know, maybe we just start a list with the emails that we have and, and then maybe, because a lot of people like when we were selling the kits, like, um, they didn't like want to give an email because they're like, I already get too many emails. Yeah, I don't want to yeah. give you my email. But in some of the other communities that have these programs, it's like they, they don't have a choice. It's like when you buy your kit, you have to give your email. So they have a... It's a two-edged sword though, isn't it? People don't want to do that. Yeah, yeah, no, it. we really did get pushback from yeah, that. A lot of people yeah. were just like, no, I don't need one more email. Like, I don't want you yeah. contacting me. I want to do this, but I don't want you contacting me. So, um, so, so those, are that, those are the metrics that we have. We have, we know how much we collect. And we know how many kits we've sold, and that's that's what we that's what we know. Um, so, uh, so how many kits have you sold? 
So we've sold clothes since the program started. We've sold close to 400 kits, but as I mentioned, there's like, um, I, I mean, I can't even guess, but I know that there's a lot of people who don't use the kit who participate. Um, and like I said, we collect about, um, you know, between three quarters and one ton, or I shouldn't say collect, divert about uh, three quarters to a ton a week. But we would like, we would like to, um, we'd like to increase that even more. Yeah, what, one of the things that I've done with the Pollinator Pathway and with the Garden Club is uh, raffles. So when we have an event, we've had a raffle, the prizes have been the compost kit. So we start out saying, you know, it's going to be this uh, vacation in the Bahamas. Um, and we say, right. oh, yeah. 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 Wrong event, it's going to be a compost <laughs> kit. <laughs> uh, but it's a, it's a great, people actually do get kind of enthusiastic yeah, about it. something for Earth Day that we could do. Yes, yeah. um, maybe, and maybe that's something that we can do when we... I would love that, yeah. that would be great. Um, um, and yeah. I know that we managed to convert somebody in the garden club who, you know, wouldn't, I wouldn't normally think about as uh, composting. And, and she was really excited because she won in the raffle. And right. Uh, her husband's now a real convert to the to the Yeah, program. I mean, I, one of the things, like when we, were, when we were set up at the recycling center to sell the kits when the program first started, um, a lot of people would say, um, like the two comments that I got the most often were like, people couldn't believe how easy it yeah, was. Yeah. And people like felt really good about doing it. Because, yeah. um, you know, there's just like, you know, you think about like all the stuff oh, that you can do and you just so sometimes feel overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. and, and this is something that you can do from day one that's easy. You, you know, like I said, you don't need to sign up for anything. You don't, you don't technically need to buy anything for it. You do have to have a a permit to get into the recycling yes. center, but, um, you know, uh, it, it, so many people, those are like the two most overwhelming comments that I've, mm -hmm. I've received from people, and and I, I just feel like once people start doing it, like they can't, they can't not do it, because they feel so terrible about putting food in the garbage, because oh, it's yes. like, it's like, it, you when I see that, when I see food mixed with other things, it make, makes me feel ill. Yeah, it, I know, it, I know. Because, I, like I said, I've been composting for yeah. so many years. Mm -hmm. but um, And the rich, wonderful soil yes. you get is such a reward. Yes. Right. It's, so, it's really win-win. Yeah, so, I mean, that's like sort of, I was, my wrap-up was just that it's so easy. Yeah. It's like really important and, and particularly important now that like we really have this waste crisis in the state yes um yes. you know some you know the the whole idea that um you know communities are trucking their yeah. waste to out-of-state landfills is not really a sustainable option because what's going to happen you know if kentucky or ohio you know landfills all of a sudden are like you know connecticut we don't We'll only take your garbage, but we'll only take it for, you know, they might jack up the rates, and, uh, it, and it's just going to make everything more expensive for everybody. Yeah, and not to mention the pollution from shipping. And trucking, trucking yes. Trucking, that distance, yeah. it, it's, it's appalling. Yeah, yeah. So China won't point. accept the exactly. recyclables anymore. Well, yeah. I mean, that's like a good lesson, because, yes, they were taking all of our recyclables for so long, and then... They just got to the point where they didn't want it anymore, and they shut the door, and we went into like a free fall yes. for recycling, yeah. which we're now recovering from. But um, it's just a good lesson that you know we should be a little bit more self-sufficient about that. Well, it's interesting because so. I've heard Carolyn talk about this topic um, several times, and each time I learn more, and each time I have more ideas for you know how to support her. And I think I uh, I think you know we as a group should talk maybe at our next meeting because I know we're running over now um, but thank you so much I oh, think it's welcome. been probably really helpful for the you know some of the others who weren't familiar and if anyone has questions if you go to the town website on um, dariancct.gov and um, just put in the search bar food scrap program it'll give you um, like a, a PDF of the brochure that goes into the kits yes it explains how the program works where you can get the materials that you need and also, if anyone has any questions about this or anything about recycling, you can always get that answered if you email recycle at dariancct.gov. That's like the, our recycling okay. um, email. All right, no, that's, so. that's fantastic. And if you think, Karen, if you think of any specific way in which we as a commission or individual members can help you, you know, I think we're, 
we're all up for that. Okay. Um, we'll put our thinking caps on. I think it would, you know, Earth Day would be a fun well, kind of goes with what we're trying to do to yes. become more sustainable. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I absolutely yes. will. And for the purposes of our um, application for yes. sustainable CT, I will go through the application. It's kind of like a jigsaw puzzle, mm -hmm. this application, because it's like there's actions and then it's like you have to complete this sub-action in order to get all the credit. So I will go through and pull out some of the ones, and yes. I know there are some because of the pollinator gardens that yes. we've done, that um, I think we can get credit for, and I'll make PDFs of those and email them to That'll you. That'll be fantastic, yes, and we, we'll, it'll be good to think that we can contribute something to that. It would be great. It no, we, we, um, we, that's kind of like our whole, um, our whole, like, we want to collaborate with yes, other organizations yes. in town. And we're, um, we're definitely, I, I mean, I think we're a logical uh, commission to, to, to work with, and we are looking for ways to, to do more, to do more consistently with, you know, environmental uh, work. So, uh, you know, we'd like to, to help where we can. We don't want to be a hanging basket commission. <laughs> <laughs> I think that you have already moved well beyond that when yeah. those gardens are so impressive. So well, thank you. Um, so yeah. if you don't have any other questions. No, that's it. You are released. Thank you so oh, much. Yeah, I'm going to go just because I have my yes. other meeting. So. No, that's right. And we also, we started late. We ran late. But so was, thank you so much for having me come and talk about um, it. I'm always happy to talk about um, Top Trash, you know, anything. <laughs> that, 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 no, we are um, absolutely uh, thrilled to have had you and it's off. You are first guest speaker, and oh, I think wow. we're I feel taking honored. things up a level. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, I, um, if you ever have any other questions, just give you, me a call. Or, Excellent. So, great. Well, All thank right. you so well, thank much. You. It's a good Good Thank you so Okay, bye. Nice thank you. Bye. Okay. See you soon. So, um, we, I think that was wonderful. Let, let's um, to think about uh, what we've heard, and uh, then we can regroup at our next meeting. Um, for... Katie and Jackie, who um, were able to, to join us, uh, I'm sorry for the late start, and I'm sorry you, you missed some of the talk at the beginning. We actually have a quorum, so in theory we could approve the minutes from December, but because Katie wasn't a commissioner then, I don't think it's fair to ask her to vote on a meeting she didn't attend. So let's defer approval of the minutes till yes, our next please. meeting. Yeah, And welcome, Katie. It's great to have you on board. and. Uh, I think you, uh, you know, you you heard a good talk from Carolyn this morning. I hope some of that was new to you. Uh, I would love the idea of us becoming, um, you know, ambassadors for all the things that the, the town's doing in our own sort of small the good things the town's doing groups. The good things the town's doing <laughs> on small groups, and uh, you know, we can think about how we can incorporate uh, uh, some of these messages in the activities that that we're conducting. Um, so the next item on the agenda was just, I was just going to give you a quick report. We had a meeting, Sue, Sue Oki and I met with Ed Gentile from Public Works about removing the burning bush from the slopes and while uh, he was at first very hesitant about this, uh, the bush has been there a long time and we sort of, we, the commission have let it slip and not um, kicked up a fuss about it. Um, and and Admittedly, the colour is nice and everything else, but Ed um, is very um, appreciative of the fact that this is a, you know, an, an invasive shrub. That it, it, the, the, this shrub, not this particular bush necessarily, but the burning bush as a whole, is causing huge damage to our forests. Um, it's become sort of the understory tree in our forests. You see it all around town. It has no natural predators. It seeds like crazy. The birds eat the berries. They, um, they poop them out everywhere. And what happens is the, the root system is so dense that it crowds out the native plants. Um, the bone bush doesn't host any indigenous um, insects or pollinators. So consistent with what we're trying to do on the slopes, which is to create a vibrant habitat, we asked Ed if we could remove the burning bush and uh, he's agreed to do that so that's a, a very a very good result I think and we'll be working with them and we to recommend what to put there yes uh, it's a shady spot we had suggested red twig dogwood or high bush blueberry to keep that red color and we can try that and if that doesn't work we we know there are some um, different colored uh, native plants that we could put there the Solomon seal for example nearby has has done well but 
it would be good if we could have something that's a structure maybe there. A shrub. Yeah, a shrub for the season. Yeah, and maybe another viburnum. But we we definitely now because Ed has been so gracious, we definitely have to step up to the plate and make sure that gap is 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 filled. And then the other item, as is shown to this morning, uh, we ordered bird boxes from the uh, senior centre. These are the most beautiful bird boxes. They are just exquisitely crafted by hand by the men in the senior centre. We have four. We have uh, two this size and then uh, two, no, I can't remember if this is the bigger or the smaller one, but we have different size holes for the different birds. So we can uh, tiny birds in two and the slightly larger birds in the bigger one. But it's this is so lovely. You, you tuck the basket and say you can't get a splinter, but maybe at the bottom you could get a splinter. But really smooth and uh, just exquisite. And the bottom removes like this, so we can keep them clean each season. And uh, the next issue is where exactly to put them in town hall and how to hang them. But uh, we'll. But looking at those, I think we could do like a post. Yes. And then just screw them into a the post. I th I and if we think get maybe a, a yeah. Um, shouldn't shouldn't they be on a tree? Well, I hate the idea of stabbing a tree, but I was thinking maybe on the back of the the concrete planters. I, I think the best thing to do is talk to public works because they may have views on where they want the birds or where they don't want the birds. And they've also been so helpful in putting up our sign. And they are great uh, craftsmen too at, at uh, you know, that sort of thing. Making so things work, yeah. I think they'll have some ideas. So I've, probably the next step is to <laughs> chat with them and get them up early spring. Mm -hmm. um, maybe as we remove the burning bush. <laughs> So uh, I'm trying to get, move a little bit more quickly now. Uh, so we I put on here schedule next cleanup, but it's awfully cold. I'm not yeah. sure that there's I, yes. a whole I lot we can we do right now. Uh, this may just be a legacy item from warmer warmer months when we've met. So let let's table that for for now. And then Tracy, do you want to talk about budget? Well, and sorry, ladies on the phone, I did not email this, but I can certainly send it out. Um, I prepared. You see where where the accounts are, um, you know the uh, the capital account. We're down to twenty one twenty seven. I do have two invoices to put through against the capital account. The balance is the the balance due on the Mo Green, and that was for the um, um, uh, the, clean, the the maintaining of the lawns and so forth. The organic maintain maintenance of the lawns at Town mm -hmm. Hall. So we, we're, I'm about to put in an invoice for 711.48, which was the balance due on that original invoice. But uh, Julian, Julian and I were talking, and we are going to also transfer 757 from the capital account back to our line account because I had originally paid that invoice from the line account for our deposit for the half that we paid in June, and that really, since it is part of the town hall project, should come from our capital account. Yeah. So and, and uh, that's good because that really takes our capital down and I think town is interested in getting rid of all these little bits and pieces of capital mm -hmm. that we left. And then in it um, then we also had the payment for um, I have to put through and I just set, did it today, the payment for the invoice from Rings End and that was for the lumber and materials for these boxes for the yeah. senior center for the uh, men's woodworking group there. Um, so we'll uh, get those paid, and then we'll bring that'll bring the balance down to about five hundred and twenty dollars left in our capital account. Excellent. So um, our line account, you know, is ninety nine sixty seven at this point. And what I was saying to Juliet, I'm going to send out my email to start getting the funds in from um, the hanging baskets for like the library and uh, Penny Glassmeyer and. Um, uh, uh, you know, the other or other other outside people that buy the baskets from mm -hmm. us so that we can um, then get our account get our account up a little bit so and we, we've paid a deposit. we've paid half of that we've paid half. all right so we should be okay right yeah okay so and that's pretty much I think where we stand we okay. you know in December I paid elder for uh, the cleanup of all three eggs at 11 um, Gardens. Yes. And I, you know, as we were saying at the start of the meeting, I think Elder did a nice job, and um, you know, and I will speak with Elder about maybe uh, taking on one of the gardens yes. to maintain, and you know, for our, our adopt a garden. Okay, that sounds great. And that's uh, it. 
All right. So, does anybody have any other business? No? I think, I think we're good. This, I think this was a great meeting. Uh, as I say, no, I always learn so much from Karen. Very informative. Yeah, yeah I'm really glad to learn that bones can now. I'll, yes. As I, you know, figured I'm composting at home, no point in doing it, taking it to town hall. But the bones are something else. Right, right. Well, no, I think it's um, great. If if just one person changes habits, it's you know the, the meeting's worthwhile. I think. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So well, thanks everybody. I, I I'm very uh, very happy. I think that was a good exhilarating meeting to start the year with. <laughs> All right, so I uh, can have a motion to adjourn. I could, should be something here. Right. Right. So move. So thank you, Sue. Second. Second. Thank you, Tracy. All right, everybody, well, we'll see you next month, and I'll be in touch. And if you guys have any ideas um, as to, you know, how we can uh, help Carolyn, just email me, or uh, we can just chat about it at our next meeting.